This is the Big O Show. This is the Big O Show. Like that, uh, and Les Claypool is another one. I, I saw him at Red Rocks, uh, Les Claypool, and he can't sing either. You don't go see uh, Les Claypool for – you go see him for his bass, not for his voice. And uh, even in, in, in uh, Red Rocks, he couldn't sing. <laughs> it didn't matter. Anyway, let's uh, let's get to it. Let's talk a little sports. Yes, sir. Although, did you go with uh, any of the music talk uh, – uh, that I uh, just went over, how there are some singers that have a sound. They really don't sing. Well, I mean, I'm from the Northeast. Like, Bruce Springsteen is the epitome of that, isn't he? No, he can sing, bro. I oh. feel like Bruce Springsteen just screams in the life. <laughs> no, 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 no. He can sing, bro. He can sing. No, no, no. I, He's, like, he see, I always felt like that about him. I always felt like... Now, now the guy I'm going to say can sing, but it's a very different sound. It's like Getty Lee with Rush. Oh yeah, definitely. It's uh, yeah. Right. He's, Getty Lee uh, it's is like a permanent. Really it's like a permanent falsetto that he's in. If you hear, like, if you know Rush and you hear a song, you know immediately it's Rush. Of course. Like they're they're so unique in the way that they you know played music. So I I think they're a they're an example of that. Um, but yeah, yeah. There's definitely there's definitely bands you listen to, at least I listen to, that aren't necessarily like classically uh, great vocalists. But they're they're just they're great at what they do. Yes, no, I'm with you there. All right. So, what'd you think of the whole Jonathan Taylor fiasco? I uh, I never had this thing happening because I never thought there was ever a. I just think Chris Greer is he's a shyster. Okay. I mean, he's, we talk. He, he he doesn't offer anything significant. He'll steal Jalen Ramsey from your ass for a third rounder. Uh, my brother, if you go back and look at the Tunsil and the and the San Francisco 49er trades, those are two of the greatest trades in the last 23 years in the NFL. Okay. Can't argue it. The yeah, amount of players yeah. they got in the last trade with San Francisco that they went and got their quarterback for the three first rounders, they ended up getting Waddle, Chubb, Ramsey for the trade. Correct. Like they, that, no, no, I agree with you. That's oh. stupid, okay? That's ridiculous. And he did the same thing for the Tunsil trade. He got a whole bunch of players around this team for the Tunsil trade. And and then you, Christian Wilkins, bro, he's given you everything. And then he wants money, but then you turn to him and say, but, bro, you haven't given us sacks. And you're not ready to give him the money. And it's like, that's a hard line, bro, to draw right there. You know what I'm saying? This guy, I don't think people realize they think Mike Tannenbaum is still in charge, that he's Oprah and you get a pick and you get a pick and you get millions and you get millions and we're just going to give things away. That's not the way these guys are anymore. They're pretty smart when it comes to their wheeling and dealing. They are. Um, yeah, these aren't the days in Miami of Donnell LRB and uh, Mike Wallace getting just contracts that no one can understand the second they were signed. Look. Wow, that's good. That was good. That was um, really um, good. That's right. I bring the heat. Uh, look, so yeah. I, the Jonathan Taylor stuff. We talked about that the last couple of weeks. Like not even just to, not just about the Dolphins, but in general. Look, no team was doing this. And the one thing that I can't stand in our business, it drives me crazy, is when you know somebody is throwing something out there just to push a narrative that they know is false, but they're doing somebody there as a favor. This idea that the Colts had multiple good offers is insane. If right. they had one good offer, they would have done it. Like, right. They, they didn't have an offer, not an offer that they were looking for. Now, there was some report out there earlier today. I honestly don't know who put it out there, so forgive me for that. But I saw it as I was scrolling that they wanted Jalen Waddle. Oh, yeah, that was uh, that was Stephen Holder, and I trust yeah. him. I trust him. I, in I, fact, I, Stephen's, I, I, Stephen's I've known one of my best friends in the business. Yeah, so, I've known Stephen for 20 years. So, Stephen's, yeah. yeah, Stephen's the best. And he's, and he's also – he lived in Miami for years, so he's, yes. he's in both areas. If Stephen said it, it's fact. That's yeah. crazy. There's, there's no world where the Dolphins are giving up a top 15 receiver in the league on a rookie deal – for a running back who they've got to pay market value to and give up a pick. Now, maybe in that scenario, they're not giving up a pick. I would hope not. Right, right, but right. Like, what there was, look, we talked about, again, we talked about this, right? There is no world any team was giving the Colts a top 50 pick and then paying Jonathan Taylor what he wanted to be paid. Of no, 
There was nobody who was going to give Dalvin Cook money. Austin Eckler can't get an extension. Saquon Barkley can't get a new deal. Josh Jacobs can't get a new deal. Jonathan Taylor was not getting a deal after a team gave up a premium pick. So right. now we're going to move forward. He's on the pup list. The next time he can get traded is right before the Halloween trade deadline. And guess what? Nobody's going to give it to them either. No one's doing this. It, so it, He's going to be in Indianapolis. Yeah. And the worst thing you did was screw your young quarterback. And they're really good in Indianapolis. Oh, they true. couldn't build a line for luck, and he took a beating for hell. You're and now right. you brought in a young quarterback, and you irresponsibly – are not going to put his best offensive weapon next to him for the first month of the season. I, I mean, the the king's size of stupidity that is coming out of that organization is just, it's, Urshie it's mind-boggling. Urshay talks when he doesn't have to. And owners in the NFL, by and large, should cut the checks and get out of it. Like, yeah. you're there to make money. It's an investment. And look, there are some guys who really want to win, and that's great. I think it's great for the sport. It's great for their fans. You can want to win and not be involved. The Maras, the Roonies. You never hear from the Roonies, ever. No. You never heard from Art Rooney or anything. Like, ever. Nope. You don't hear from the Mara family. You don't hear from the Hunt family. You nope. don't hear You don't hear from Stan Kroenke, who spends billions of dollars. Like You hear from Jerry Jones, who hasn't won a Super Bowl ever without Jimmy Johnson or the team that Jimmy Johnson built. Okay. You hear, you heard a lot about anyway, maybe not from, but about Dan Schneider, who was obviously a disaster. You hear a lot about the Davis ownership in, in Vegas, which has not gone great. You don't want to hear from your owner all the time. Right. You want your owner to spend money, delegate the responsibilities to people who know better, and get the hell out of the way. Ursa exactly. doesn't do that. He gets involved. It really ticked off Jonathan Taylor, and so now here we are. Yeah. It just it, it is mind-boggling to me how stupid you would handle this and then and then you know mishandle uh your your young quarterback because that kid really needed Jonathan Taylor. It is going to be that much harder for him now uh to to get through the first month of the season. Yeah. All right. Now go ahead. What were you going to say? No, yeah. I mean absolutely without without Taylor what is that offense? It's Michael Pittman and it's Anthony Richardson running for his life. I mean, that's what it is. I like Evan Hall, their rookie running back at Northwestern. He's not Jonathan Taylor. Like, I, it's going to be rough. I, I picked them to be the worst team in the AFC before this thing with Jonathan Taylor. I certainly believe that now. New England, can you figure out what's going on? Like, so you cut Bailey Zappi and you only have one quarterback on the roster and. You know, the farther we get from the Tom Brady era, uh, the dumber Bill Belichick seems to look, okay? And I get it. He's going to go down as the great one in all the championships. But, brother, your look post-Brady has looked so dysfunctional. I mean, you're about to start the season. You have one quarterback on the roster? That's asinine, dude. That's crazy. It's very bizarre, and I've seen people say, well, they did it because they've got another move coming. Okay, great. Then keep Bailey Zappi on the roster until you make that move and then release him. Like, what? And then there's all this stuff about, well, they want him back on the practice squad. You need a back quarterback. Yes. I, like, I don't understand. Like, why wouldn't you then just make that move and then release Zappi and try to resign him for the practice squad? Right. I, I wrote a long time, years ago, like, while the Patriots were still who they were, I wrote a piece when I was at Fansided. Like, Bella, they're, the Pat's biggest problem is that Belichick's the GM of the team. And he right. shouldn't be the GM of the team. He should be the coach of the team. Yes. And a lot of Patriots fans were furious about that. I was like, look, he's an amazing coach, which I believe that he is. Defensively, I don't think you, you can count on maybe one hand, and maybe you don't even need any fingers to count the coaches that are better defensive coaches in the history of the NFL. Uh, he amen. is one of one. He's not a general manager. No. Since he's been in charge of running their personnel department, that they have not drafted particularly well, but that was covered up forever because they had Brady. They don't have Brady anymore. And so now you have this situation where you look at them and go, okay, why? Like, why would you cut yourself down to one quarterback? The only team in the league that did it, by the way. And so now you're sitting here 
And what is Carson Wentz coming in? Because I got to tell you, Carson Wentz and Bill Belichick might be the worst match in the history of mankind. I can't imagine Bill Belichick coaching Carson Wentz. Yeah, I know. Not, not going to happen. No. So where is it going? It's very bizarre. I don't understand it. If you want a different backup, that's totally fine. Sure. But then just keep Zappy until you sign the backup and then get rid of him. Put him on the practice squad if you can. Fine. Very bizarre. Very, very bizarre. Well, when we go around the AFC East, you know, I looked at the Jets offensive line situation. It's really bad. Uh, the Patriots have some issues. Hell, they had to trade for a lineman now because they have so many issues. The Bills have a cup. Do you know that as much as Dolph fans might be worried, they might end up having the best offensive line in the stinking division, in the division, which is really odd to say or even think? It's... I think it's going to be a fascinating division. And SI has been publishing our, our um, divisional previews throughout the course of the week. And, and for any way, by the way, I actually have to have it right here. I'm not just trying to shell, but magazine's out. Go out, buy it. I did every AFC preview in this bad boy. So go check it out. Um, look, I think the Dolphins, if two is healthy, I think they're the best team in the division. And I think they're the best team in the division for a variety of reasons. First of all, I think they have the most talent. I think Fangio is the biggest upgrade any team made all year. The offensive line, I don't think it's going to be great, but I think it's going to be good enough. And the right. rest of the lines in that division, you don't know what you're getting out of New England. I know what I'm getting out of the Jets, and it's not great. And Oof. the Bills, I look at and say, okay, look, I like Morse and I like Dawkins. But other than that, like, I don't know. I mean, right. Spencer Brown's not a great right tackle. The guard play is a question mark, I think is fair to say. Like, And with Buffalo – I don't like for years on end. It's been well. They have Allen and they have a really good defense. I don't know that they have a really good defense. Miller's on the pup list. Hyde and Poyer are well over thirty, coming off years where they were hurt. Tre'Davious White came back last year from his ACL. He did not look like the same player. That Kyer Elam can't even get on the field. I mean, he he's behind Chris Benford and Dane Jackson right now. And I think they're one of the few teams in the NFL that has an active volcano wearing a, a, a jersey. And his name is Stephon Diggs. No I mean, last week in the preseason game, he, he got yeah. tackled in the open field and he went back to the sideline and slammed his helmet. And it's like, yo, bro, it's not you're good. in a preseason no. game and you're losing your mind? I, I'm like, this is going to be a sh show yeah. from here on out. I, I think the Bills are going to kind of implode a little bit, bro. I think they're a playoff I mean, team, but I don't think, I don't think they're – on the level of Kansas City or Cincinnati anymore. I no, I, no. I don't. I, I think if they play either one of those two teams in a playoff game, they're going to get boat raced. I, that, that's how I feel going through the season. Now, maybe by the end of the season, I'll feel differently, but right now, that's how I feel. I just – I look at them. They didn't replace Edmonds, and and we've talked a little bit about this. The problem the Bills have had over the years, Miami's drafted really, really well, which is why they're set up the way they are. Okay, The Bengals have drafted really well. Jacksonville's drafted well. Kansas City, even after the Mahomes, has drafted very well. Guys like Bolton and Creed Humphrey. Problem in Buffalo is they haven't drafted well. I mean, he's he, he just been pick after pick after pick after pick. We are like either the guy's just average or, he, or he's flat out not cutting it. Their best picks in the last four years have been Dawson Knox and Gabe Davis. Knox is now splitting time with Dalton Kincaid, and Gabe Davis doesn't have a contract for next year. So it's a problem. And I just wonder with the Bills, I've, I've always wondered with teams in general, when they lose a game, it's just devastating. Some teams come back from that stronger, more unified. It, it galvanizes them. We're never going to let it happen again. And some teams never really recover from it. I will always wonder until they prove otherwise if that 13 seconds game in Kansas City just kind of broke them. They should have won that game, hosted the AC title game. Their roster's gone downhill since. It seems like there's more issues inside the building now than there were then. I just wonder if the pressure, the mounting pressure has started to bust a few pipes in Buffalo. Yeah, that's why I think there's going to be a little bit of an implosion there in Buffalo this year. I think there's I think some of their dysfunction is going to come out and I think it's going to end up hurting them. That's why I think the Dolphins end up winning that division. Uh let me ask you something. If you're a week out and your quarterback's already missed 33 days with a calf injury and calves can be kind of tricky. Yes. How concerned should a Bengals fan be with Joe Burrow for week 1? 
concerned. I wouldn't say wildly in the sense that I, I think the Bengals know enough that you can't start him if he's, you know, 80% on a calf because 80 could turn into 20 really fast. I mean, all the year. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I mean, that's it, right? I mean, you could be, you're out for two months. You're out. Like, let's face it. Let's even say Burrow, if he re injures that thing, he's out four to six weeks. Yeah, their season's over. Like that, that's it. In the AFC, then the NFC, maybe you could find some way that, you know, hey, you go three right. and three and you middle it. Okay. In the AFC, depending on what part of the schedule you're in, you're one in five. Like season's not. I, I think the Bengals should feel confident in the sense that they cut Trevor Simeon. They only have Jake Browning and, and Burrow on the roster, which would tell you they think that Burrow is healthy and going to be able to play. But it, it's got to be a concern. I mean, we've seen with Aaron Rodgers. Now, Rodgers is a lot older. Yeah, but I think that's a actually. I think that's I think that's a bigger concern than Burrow. Actually, the Rodgers thing because that line is so bad, right. and he has two calf issues because he just injured yes. what they called his good calf, and he already had bang, he already had banged up his bad calf earlier before that. So for me, you know, and Rodgers can't move around like he used to. If he's got to be on the run a lot, I would not be surprised to see some breakdown with Aaron Rodgers too. I, you know how I feel. I mean, I'm not in on this love in with the Jets. I think the Jets are going to be fine. I think the Jets are going to fight for a playoff spot. I think they might even get a playoff spot, but I'm not. This idea that the Jets are just going to come out and be this dominant force, I have major reservations about all that yeah. happening. I mean, I, I don't trust the offensive line. Other than Garrett Wilson, who's the guy in that team you're scared of? Who's the guy? I mean, I, like, Alan Lazard is fine. Brees, so. Brees Hall um, from the backfield, but. Outside of uh, and as receivers, you're right. There's only I mean, one I, guy you fear. I watched McCole Hardman every snap of his career. He's nice. McCole Hardman's going to have two games where he plays and, and has a big stat line, and the rest of it you're going to be like, oh, McCole Hardman did two catches for 17 yards. I mean, that's just the way it is. He's a and fourth it, receiver, bro. Is he, what he's McCall a returner. He's a, that, that's it. I mean, so I look at the Jets, and everybody also talks. The, the, other, the other thing I find very interesting with the Jets, people talk about the defense like they're the 85 Bears, and it's like, Sauce Gardner's great. DJ Reed's a really good corner. Quinnen Williams is an excellent, excellent defensive tackle. Yeah. Outside of that, I don't know. I mean, is there a great edge rush? I don't know. Is there great play on the second level? I don't know. Like, do I think they're a good defense? Yes, absolutely. Do I think they're going to be this dominant, like giving up 14 points a game defense? No. And the other thing I'd point out, and it's the same, by the way, this is also true in Denver. So people last year are like, man, Denver's defense, unbelievable. The Jets' defense, if they had a quarterback, and look at the numbers they put up defensively. There's a push-pull to that. Part of the reason they're so great statistically on defense is because these other teams don't have to take any chances ever on offense because they right. know they're going to give up 10 points. I mean, if, you, if you're playing the Jets last year or the Broncos last year, you're not going to be aggressive offensively. Why the hell would you be? You'll play field position. You'll wait for Zach Wilson to throw a pick, and then you'll score a touchdown. Defensive numbers tend to move with how good your offense is because if your offense is really good, your defense is going to give up some more points and some more yards. It's just a matter of whether it's because it's late in the game or because other teams go, look, we got to go full throttle the whole game. We're not going to have a shot to win. Nobody was doing that last year against Zach Wilson. So I I think there's a push-pull that the people don't factor in. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. All right. So what happens, uh, with your boy, Chris Jones, bro? <laughs> what happens with Chris Jones? That is the, uh, what, what is it now? $1.9 million question and counting, uh, as it defines keep racking. I understood why he held out during training camp because look, okay, fine. He can afford it. Fair enough. And he's making a point. Maybe he doesn't want to be a camp. I think now he's to a juncture where he's really hurting himself with the leverage here. Like, if you're the Chiefs, this whole idea that he's going to miss games, if you're Kansas City, who cares? I mean, if he's going to sit out a couple of games, he's a great player. And without him, their defense is a, a major, major, major player short. I'm not saying they're not. But if that if that team plays, well, play, plays as well as it can offensively, Still going to beat the Lions. They're still going to beat the Bears and the Vikings and probably even Jacksonville and probably like you know. Like, so he's all he's threatened to sit out seven games. Look at their schedule; those first seven games without him, they're probably still six and one, five and two. Like they'll they'll win. And my thing is, 
for next year, every game that he misses, it lowers his cap number for a franchise tag. Right. So the Chiefs just get him on a cheaper deal. Like I, it makes it much harder for him to ask for twenty eight to thirty million a year if his cap number next year would be twenty four. Why would the Chiefs give that to him? So I think if you're Jones, look, I get why he's angry, and I don't like I told in some ways I agree with him, but I do think that now. If he starts missing regular season games, history says you're just hurting yourself. The teams don't really care because they know you're coming back at some point. So right. I, I think at this point, the leverage is starting to shift from it was kind of split. Now I think it becomes if Jones holds out, it's just really hurting him. Ugly situation. I wonder if he's trying to do a little Emmett Smith right. from years yeah. back that Emmett missed those first games and the Cowboys played like crap and then they panicked right away. And I wonder if he's and he and his agent are like, let's let, let, let him play without you and then let's see what happens. And, and be careful what you ask for because some there's an offensive league. And if they can somehow play decent I mean, defense and Mahomes can score the offense, then you know it's not gonna make you look nearly as good. You know, Emmett back in those days, it was a run oriented yes, type of he was offense. the offense. Right. Whereas nowadays you know, offense is passing. So the question is, can Kansas City survive without him and at least be, you know, decent defense without him? That's the question. And I think if you look at their schedule, so they open with the Lions, who I think are a good team. Pretty good team. offensively, too. They are. They are. But I also think, like, that's a game where the Chiefs, I could just see them winning, like, 35 to 30 or something. Like yeah, they, they should win. Out. Yeah. Then they play Jacksonville. That's a tough game. Mm -hmm. They could lose that game. Uh, it's on the road. Then they play the Bears at home. They're winning that game. Yeah, uh, yeah. Jets. As long as, long as, as long as you can control fields running. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, you know? it's one of those things. My guess would be this. They will just score 35 points pretty much every game. They have and to. And find a way. And then and that's the risk. And I, I talked about this with um, some. They have, to play, they have to play the Marino game of the 80s. Yes. Score, <laughs> score a crap load of points and hope your defense can, you know, <laughs> limit them to 40. So you it, could get 42. It's a big risk because what happens if like nobody's going to care about the statistics of it all. They're going to care about the win and loss record. If exactly. he holds, let's say he holds up the first three weeks of the year, they're going to be favored to beat the Lions, Jags, and Bears, even without him. Like, mm -hmm. what if they win all three of those games? Even if they give up Ooh. 28 points a game, they're not going to care as long as they're right. winning. And then what leverage do you have? Then it's like, well, <laughs> they didn't need me to win. I I still think it makes sense to sign the deal now because frankly. When is he going to be worth more? He's he's going to be 30 next year. He's coming off a top three year in terms of defensive player of the year voting. First team all pro and they won the Super Bowl. The odds that you're going to have all that going for you at any point going forward is, is slim. I mean, everything lined up for you, both team and player-wise. I just think that it's a huge gamble to play this year out without a contract. And then what? I mean, they're going to tag him. So then right. it becomes like, okay, now you got to get off the tag. It's just... It's ugly. It's gotten really ugly. Follow him on Twitter at Matt Verderam. Catch his exceptional work there at Sports Illustrated. Matt, as always, thank you for taking some time, my brother. We'll catch up next week. Have a great weekend. Sounds good. Take care, guys. Thank you, my brother. There you go. Matt Verderam from Sports Illustrated. Love it. Love it. Love it.